Good afternoon, guys. Uh, Alok from Orient Bell Tiles. Uh, I'm here today with architect Dharpan Katyal, uh, the chairman of the IBS School of Design, uh, MD Urbain, the design works. I hope I got the pronunciation right. I've been known to mess up pronunciations. Uh, and also the co-founder of Center of Design and Innovation. Uh, thank you, Dharpan, for taking out the time to join us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Alok. And uh, we've, been, we've been talking over the phone, not like this. So this is very, very exciting for me to, to talk to you like that and also being seen by so many people. I think we can, uh, we can make it exciting for ourselves and for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how has the lockdown been for you? I think it's uh, uh, like for everyone, it's been a crazy and interesting time. When it started, I decided that I'm going to enjoy this because I knew it's not going to be uh, for a short period. And I also... Uh, you know, I haven't got a sabbatical in the last 25 years of my career. So this was my first and the best sabbatical. Yeah. Uh, not only that I spent time with my kids and family, which everyone did. I also, like everyone, introspected. I took up a challenge. I thought that, you know, uh, let me read through and let me predict future. So I started writing a, uh, an article about how, uh, you know, the challenges will give us new opportunities. So I've written that paper. I hopefully should be out very soon. It'll be very interesting read. Very, very interesting because I've covered all the sectors. I've covered pretty much everyone. No, that, that's fabulous. And given that you're talking of different sectors, you know, you have an amazing perspective on different sectors, thanks to the IBS. Uh, it yeah. is in April, I think a lot of children were getting placed. How have the various sectors responded? Have you had scary things like, uh, God forbid, people saying, no, 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 I want to change my mind. I no longer want to accept graduates. Not want to change what? Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, did people want to change or uh, change on uh, their offers? Did they want to cancel the offers that they had made to your students, graduates? No, uh, not till date. Uh, uh, and to be very frank, I told my students and I totally believe in this, specifically in our industry, uh, building industry, till the time mankind will progress, we will need buildings to habitat, for the habitat. And uh, we will never go out of uh, work. The only thing is sometimes new projects don't happen. But specifically for interior designers who we churn out, we essentially deal in interior architecture and design courses uh, in our field. Uh, I have always seen, and you know, in last 2009 uh, uh, economic meltdown also, there were many opportunities of retrofitting which came in. Also, people move from expensive locations to uh, cheaper locations. So that phenomena, in any case, uh, incites more new projects. So there is always opportunity for interior architecture and design, more than sometimes architects. And that's where when we started off, we had a separate section for interior design and we've always focused on that because that has really helped us to uh, have business in bad markets also. So for, for my students, I, I immediately got on uh, on Zoom. For the first time, we could reach out to everyone because we were online. And all of them uh, were told by me that, uh, that you are in the right uh, area, you know, and this is the new perspective. If you look at retrofit market, there'll be enough work. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And how do you see the various sectors uh, responding? So, uh, so I, uh, to be very frank, I am, I am uh, very disappointed with the response, right? Uh, I see uh, unnecessarily pes pessimism, uh, scare and scare of uh, Corona as well as, uh, you know, uh, getting quarantined in the hospital, government hospital setting in. So, and uh, people, even after uh, things have opened, opened up. A lot of people are not getting out. Uh, people are not looking at uh, new opportunities. Yes, a lot of things will not do well. But uh, these challenges provide new opportunities and we create those opportunities. So I strongly feel that people have to be optimistic and they have to look forward. And only then we will start transactions in a normal way. Just imagine a situation that there was a pause, you went into coma and you got on with your life the next day. Like that, and do not change your behavior, everything will be fine within one year. And I would say in a month's time, we'll recover from the immediate loss, at least behind and move forward towards progress. So 
so i think it's the attitude which is right attitude which is required and i hope that everyone thinks in 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 the way i do because a lot of people who call me and i speak like that and they say that you're the only one who's talking like that i said it is sad i don't feel very good about it i may be the the probably the only one but i don't want to be the only one what will i do alone right right now i'm glad we are talking because we tend to think similarly in fact uh, if anything my team would say the last eight weeks have been incredibly intense as we have kept on uh, you know developing uh, various assets on digital and really trying to make uh, shopping more frictionless for our right. category so we have right. been doing a lot of work and okay. it's a fabulous opportunity because there are no distractions you don't have to worry about uh, i mean you're returning fewer phone calls so you know you have the time to do quality work great uh, did you have any on site projects something under construction or something that was uh, you know already at the site with dependent on labor yeah yeah so uh, so there were uh, many projects happening in different parts of at least north india where we focus now and uh, we actually uh, and because of the writing that paper i immediately predicted that we will have shortage of labor and, and you know i had the situation i always uh, try to understand the pulse of the grassroots level guys also because it is very important when you are running uh, this kind of business because we are dependent on them, uh, good or bad so i immediately realized that their parents are calling up and asking them and telling them that ye shari bimari hai bhai wapas aa jao so i said that this this whole phenomena will lead to exodus and i wrote that in that paper on the second day of lockdown i said these people will move back we will not have uh, labor so this is the time and you know this is what we've started we said that we need people need more work i didn't know that there were more projects coming in at that time so i was very skeptical about new projects so i said let me start new divisions so i'm i'm happy to inform you that we started two new divisions one was about post covid uh, uh, or post lockdown uh, uh, work workspace uh, solutions nice for for the compliance uh, and you know our experience in healthcare sector provides us a very different kind of uh, understanding of how these spaces have to be handled for infection uh, secondly i realized that there will be exodus and you will not have workforce so it will push the industry towards mechanization the biggest and you know i tried that once a uh, long time back the biggest issue was training of manpower right so today we have uh, you know we have an education venture going so we have campuses where we can train so we started a a, a division where we would sell uh, machinery or mechanize uh, solutions for other uh, people in the industry and also as part of the package train them uh, uh, institutes and uh, use it ourselves also in our projects because when once you have these tie ups you have spare parts you know these are the issues when you uh, getting into mechanization you need the right tie ups you need right warranties you need spares you need good uh, training and i have done that before so i knew the challenges so i immediately latched on to it and we started that again challenges provide new opportunities khali to bas nahi we don't have to sit idle and that's what uh, uh, you know humans are known for absolutely no incredible in fact uh, you have done uh, and i would get on to sustainability the topic of our discussion but mm-hmm. healthcare is such a topical subject we can't let it pass right uh, you have uh, or your team has uh, you know done a lot of healthcare projects be it the artemis hospital in gurgaon or raliga diagnostics a couple of other institutes as well right uh, you know re- reflecting back uh, on this uh if you were designing them again for the post covid era uh, would you do, what would you do differently so uh, first thing first uh, you know time is changing in healthcare uh, and uh, just to tell you that most of the procedures today are uh, you know a patient can go from day care they are simple incisions and you don't need to cut open so in any case uh i always predicted that opd will become virtual very soon which has already happened during covid right. so we will we will not have very soon the new hospitals will not have very large opds it will have very small opd section opd is outpatient department where doctors you know you go and consult doctors uh and then uh you know most of your rooms 
which are called IPD inpatient department, uh, will uh, tune down into a, maybe a, a recliner where after the procedure you lie down, you're under watch and then you walk out of the hospital. So the, the real estate will squeeze. But uh, because of COVID, now hospitals will be ready for these kind of infections. So you will have a separate isolation department or severe infection department. So a lot of this space will get free in existing hospital and these uh, hospitals will uh, you know, allocate area for this new department to happen. And the new formats will be designed in that fashion. And so the hospital will change its shape. Sure. Uh, so I think the real estate itself will squeeze in many sectors because of this, including healthcare. Right. And you become far more efficient. I think. Interesting. And when you say severe, you mean contagious or do you mean something else when you use the word severe uh, illnesses? So contagious is one part of it. And then so infections will and it, it should be, it should have been a separate area. So when we, let's say in path lab, when you look at these kind of infections and you know tests to be done, there is a separate area, isolated area allocated for them because any infection can be contagious viruses yeah. can mutate and let me tell you the biggest problem in hospitals today is the secondary infection so you and i probably go for a very small procedure or to see a doctor and we carry the infection back and these are mutated viruses and they you know normal antibiotics don't work on them so we don't realize that that these patients need to be segregated because they are look they are affecting the health of healthy patients also. Sure. So that understanding will set in. Right, right. And, and I find this very unusual, you know, because I would expect uh, the hospital to have the gold standard of hygiene. How then do secondary infections happen? So simple thing like, uh, you know, like we are saying that through touch and through uh, breathing, so sure. they're saying that uh, uh, corona is not airborne, yeah. but you still have droplets coming out. So hospital is the space where the patient next to you might be suffering from TB. Right. And there are many other infections, virus, viruses, which get spread through surface contact or through airborne. Right. So you are entering into an environment, you're mixing people up and then having uh, these secondary infections because these viruses mutate uh, in hospital itself. Right, right. And aren't there, for example, uh, existing technologies uh, to make as many surfaces uh, antimicrobial? Right. So as in chairs, uh, cushions, uh, walls, I mean, tiles, I know we can. So tiles can be antimicrobial, at least we have them. So, or, you know, whatever else, maybe tabletops. Uh, don't those technologies uh, prevail? So to be very frank, there was a big movement happening where many companies and smart uh, uh, people uh, from these companies were already working on antibacterial microbial range. Uh, sure. And some of the companies had stopped manufacturing uh, other products. Sure. Uh, but this will definitely uh, increase that. Uh, also, there are what people don't understand is there are many coatings available. These coatings are live coatings. They're called BioGuards, BioShield. So they, they don't allow viruses and bacteria to grow on them. Please understand that we live in subtropical climate. Right. It, the environment itself is conducive for many infections to happen. And you know, when we get virals, virals get transferred in your offices, workspaces, hospitals, and various areas, we don't care about them. Right? Uh, if we start caring about them, we would start looking at them. This is only after Corona, probably people have understood that how it can become a pandemic and, you know, uh, a pandemic can become epidemic and then, you know, things can go out of the hand. Right. But I think we need to move. Uh, and uh, I think uh, materials need to be antimicrobial and antibacterial in our environment, specifically in our climate. Yeah, yeah. No, I can definitely see a great attraction. So uh, having tried to uh, evangelize germ-free tiles to a lot of uh, healthcare patients. The challenge has all, all, always been kaha, kaha lagao. You know, it typically gets restricted to the ICU or the OPD, whereas it's not a topical application really. It needs to be there everywhere. So let me tell you, uh, 
I, we have always looked at when we look at a, a healthcare project, we only choose those products which are antibacterial and microbial in their properties. And uh, uh, it is very, very important that most of these uh, systems also should be jointless and seamless. If they are tiles, they have to be jointless. They, they should not have grooves. If they are, if you can have seamless materials, like, you know, for, for that matter, if you use vinyl in, in many areas, we've done, when we did Artemis Hospital, it was probably the first project in India where 2.5 lakh square feet was done with complete vinyl, including corridors and everything. So you, sure. you would hate me because we didn't do tiles and we recommended uh, vinyl at that time. But I think tile industry need to move ahead. There are two things which I would suggest for tile industry for, for this, uh, for the time coming ahead. One is tile, you know, stone was labor intensive. So we moved to tile to do quick construction. Sure. There, is no, there is no labor available for tile fixing now. Let me right. tell you, that's the bad news. So yeah. it, you will have to move to interlocking kind of system where you lay tiles like laminate floor. Okay. You will have to have wall cladding, dry wall cladding systems now. And that's the future. And these tiles, joints have to be such that you, the interlocking system does not allow liquid to travel or any biomass to get collected into, into those areas. So sure. that's, that's the future uh, for tile industry. Right. So I, I strongly feel, and you know, to be very frank, I've been looking for at these solutions because I know the challenge. We run construction industry and we run uh, a design practice. So I understand both sides of it. So I have to find the balance. So I'm looking at new products. And the good news is there are few, but there are. So I strongly suggest tile manufacturers to look at this very, very seriously. It's a great opportunity. Uh, it's a new opportunity. And whoever will come in first will take the cake. No, absolutely. I think uh, uh, wall claddings or uh, interlocking would pick up. We are also looking at off-site construction. Hopefully, uh, that would pick up in the weeks to come. Right. Uh, the other thing is uh, uh, often grouting could be antimicrobial as well. So there are uh, uh, we are trying to create ecosystems where it's easier for people implementing projects to right. find antimicrobial grout solutions as well. So there are pros and cons of everything. And it's the trade-offs that either the local architect or the local uh, interior designer would make. Right. And so that's how it would go. Great. I think let's get back to the topic. Otherwise, we would keep uh, going off track and talking about sure. everything else. Sure. Uh, tell me, let, let's first start with uh, how is sustainable architecture different from eco-friendly or green architecture? So, uh, so there are, you know, I, I want to clarify to everyone and this is the biggest problem I have found with people. They think, uh, so there are three myths related to sustainable. One is sustainable, some people say, is jhola chhap architecture. You know, something which is low cost, uh, not so great looking, not so fancy, maybe a hut in the, uh, in the forest is sustainable architecture. You can't practice sustainable in contemporary uh, times. So that's one myth which I think is absolutely uh, foolish. Uh, the second myth is that sustainable is environmental only. Sustainability, the definition of sustainability is something which can be efficient in terms of its performance throughout the life cycle of that, whether it is architecture, a process, or any product. So right. it has to be efficient in terms of its performance over the life cycle. Right. So when it comes to buildings, sustainability in true form, in, in its truth uh, or true form, has to start from manufacturing the building in the factory, which includes tiles, building materials, and so many other things, to the construction techniques. Most of the times during construction, we destroy the site, sure. right? And we destroy the area around it. Right. Then the third is throughout the life cycle of the project, which is operating that project. So it has to be sustainable during that time. Then it has to be sustainable for dismantling. So let's say your, uh, your project has to last 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. So it should be, dis when you dismantle it, during dismantling, it should not, it should be, uh, sustainable, it should be environmental and 
right? Uh, sorry, but I think uh, you have uh, uh, just give us a couple of minutes. I think that one is having a connectivity issue. Uh, uh, apologies for that. I think it's uh, a bit of a connectivity issue at that point. We will wait for it to pass. I think uh, let's just give him a couple of minutes. I'm sure uh, I think uh, these days with uh, uh, our dependence on broadband. Oh, thank you. Thank you for joining again. It's better again. Wi-Fi. I have three Wi-Fi, so hopefully this should work. Awesome. I love the backups. Great. We are all dependent on technology now. You better have backups for this. Sure. So what I was saying was, so sustainability comprises of three elements. I hope I'm audible right now. Yes, you are. Yeah. So it is social, economical, and environmental. Right. And all three components put together make anything sustainable, be it product, process, or architecture. So right. I'll give you an example, uh, a live example. You've seen Max Saket Hospital. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So Max Saket Hospital is, uh, you know, it, it started off as a tertiary hospital. It's a super speciality hospital. Absolutely. And tertiary hospital uh, it caters to a larger community, okay? But tertiary hospital caters to a community of five square kilometer, 10 square kilometer. It became one of the top hospitals in uh, of Delhi because it was designed to be such, right? With the vision. Sure. And uh, it became a social disaster because just imagine for people who are living in Saket, what it did to those them. So right. it wasn't socially sustainable. So social is that. So projects have to be socially sustainable, economically sustainable. So uh, unfortunately, Max used uh, Italian marble because it wanted to be, it wanted to compete with hotels all over the place. And just imagine uh, a person bleeding coming in and uh, something falls on Italian marble with the cracks. So what will happen to the... Uh, uh, to the maintenance, to the cost of running that hospital. So I think it was economically not so viable, but right. because it, is, it has amazing location and they're making so much of money that all these things are kind of camouflaged, right? Okay. Now, in terms of uh, uh, environmental, so what Saket Hospital has done is, because there is so much of traffic and just see uh, the number of cars around the amount of pollution it causes. And because the size of this plot is so small with so, so many uh, you know, people visiting and so many operations happening, so many uh, patients accommodated in that hospital, the amount of waste which this hospital generates actually get thrown onto the backside, which is beautiful green area of Saket. And people used to go for morning walks there. And this area touches uh, you know, the Anupam uh, PBR uh, cinema and sports complex from this side. And that green is now full of hospital waste. So the project failed to be sustainable in that community. And it, it has become, uh, I would say, uh, a problem area and an ISO. The same thing happened with district center Saket, where you have select city and all. It, district center means it caters to the district. It became the CBD, the central shopping district of Delhi. Not designed. So how will it be socially, economically, and uh, environmentally sustainable? Right. Uh, so I hope, I hope I'm clear in terms of definition that all these components put together create sustainable. So environmental is only one part of it. Right. No, I think that's very clear. I mean, uh, quite honestly, if you look at Google search volumes, everybody is looking for environmental friendly and not sustainable. So, there right. is, uh, you know, sustainable is becoming a bit like salads or exercise. We all know it's the right, right thing to do, but right. guess what? 
I like my pani puri or I like my junk food or I like uh, to be lazy. So you know, so that's where it uh, gets derailed, perhaps. Uh, you know, uh, I, you know, you have been uh, evangelizing sustainable architecture. Uh, uh, how how do you evangelize it? And especially given the, if I may say, uh, the jhola image uh, around it. Yeah. So I, uh, I time and again people ask me when I say uh, let's let's do sustainable, they get scared. They also they, the other myth is that it's expensive. Right. So people who understand sustainable. and green buildings are part of sustainable practice uh, so the minute you say that we have to go green and there are many uh, practices which happen within sustainable i also feel lean architecture is uh, something which we have to practice and lean in uh, you know business is known uh, as a concept yeah. which toyota yeah. started with uh, so there are many concepts there is environmental friendly design there is green movement there is lean architecture there is organic architecture there is four n concept four n means nature natural materials natural light natural air so all these various uh, biophilic uh, design which is the new fad today uh, with most of the designers all these practices are part of sustainable uh, practices but it is not holistic all these put together makes it holistic right. so and the uh, the idea should be social economic and uh uh you know uh, uh the environmental fr uh, friendly design now just imagine if your design is economically friendly how can it be expensive right right if your your design takes care of the user and gets that social element how can you fail right right how if your design also looks at uh, the micro environment around it the immediate neighborhood around it can you ever fail you will never fail right so these are myths that sustainable is expensive it is difficult to practice uh, there is a, a japanese architect i'm forgetting his name he's done amazing work uh, in contemporary uh, sustainable architecture in japan and some of his buildings are piece of art and they are very very sustainable they look very contemporary modern chic with lot of uh, new materials being used but uh, the buildings breathe they are not they are not uh, the kind of buildings we are making now so you know the biggest problem which i think most of the people realized over lockdown also was that we retrieved and nature took over so right. just imagine a situation where you design a building with the concept of nature taking over right and i so sustainable today and i have heard many people who have done tremendous amount of work in this field and the movement is today of not uh, taking it to become uh, less uh, uh, energy uh, consum uh, consuming or uh, would say uh, reducing the negatives it is about actually making buildings which will enhance the environment so one idea is reduce the impact sustainable architecture reduces the impact on the environment how about architecture which enhances the micro environment and the climate of the space can we work with that thought process yes we can why not all we have to do is we have to practice uh, all these things and save money also right right uh, i i would just uh, take a uh... 30 second digression there were some tech issues on zoom and people can click on the link on the comments page and they can rejoin the webinar so if you have missed a couple of minutes don't get worried uh, you know we will try and recap things uh, uh, connect on facebook live it tends to be a much more stable platform so bear with us uh, i think the architect that what you were referring to is uh, architect kemco of japan uh, if yeah. i recollect yeah. he was the one making the national stadium uh for the yes. summer olympics in 2020 yes. i mean uh, yes. some outstanding work uh you know what what stood out for me was he was a big advocate uh, of uh, go small uh, go micro so he was in fact recommending uh, 200 square feet uh, cubicles as homes or studio apartments uh, right. of course you have to think of the cost of real estate there and that's how you know there's a cultural context why 200 square feet makes sense uh 
you know so would you do micro kind of uh, apartments or would you do vertical high rises and there are uh, really big architects in india who would also you know strongly evangelize uh, tall vertical buildings so to be very frank there is no recipe to this according to me every project has its own uh, economics its own uh, you know balance which one has to achieve uh, it has to do something for for the purpose it is it is standing for so uh, i would say both make sense as long as both can be made sustainable uh, and, and uh, there are times when you would rather go tall than flat out on on ground and there are times when you would go completely flat out uh, and not go tall at all and that's what we teach in architecture that uh, the building has to conform to the site and site constraints are the biggest one of the biggest constraints right so uh, so there is no formula and both can be sustainable that's what my take is right 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 it is it is just so amazing because i've heard views of both these architects uh, equally passionately recommending saying that vertical is the only way to go and the other one equally oh. passionately recommending that flat is the only way to go so uh, so i I'll, i'll give you example of both huh? so for for everyone to understand and to clarify what i'm trying to say so let's say you get a site which is a rocky site okay right. and uh, for a high rise building uh, because you have to go tall you'll have to build uh, you know the foundations up to some some depth to kind of counterbalance the weight yeah now if i have to build a building on top of a rock and dig out the rock and spoil the ecology existing ecology of the site i would refrain from doing that i would rather just plong my horizontal building i don't even dig i just stick paste the building on top of the rock with a technology bolt it uh, do a lightweight construction and not spoil the ecology so nice. answer to every situation will be very different sure 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 no that helps me uh, what's the kind of uh, payback period roi if it's not expensive so uh, there is no uh, payback would only happen if it is expensive huh? so you have committed and to be very frank most of the times it is cheaper so uh, sustainable is something which is recyclable also in construction so uh, and i said that if you go lean and you know uh, i always challenge the way we are constructing uh, you know during gothic times our ancestors uh, were very smart they understood they were building these walls with stones which were 5 meters wide and then they realized they started making these flying buttresses and very thin uh, and that's what you see in gothic buildings and they dematerialized and then modern architecture happened and since modern era which is beginning of 1900s we haven't changed we haven't evolved in terms of construction we still do brick concrete steel buildings and most of the buildings are so you know how we build walls we do masonry we do plaster then we do pop then we do paint or paneling on top so there are 20 layers why do we need it we nobody questions it sure so uh, if we need a particular texture can we do the true surface or can we do something which is lightweight the only thing which has happened is uh, the uh, you know the rocket science which has come in is drywall so we do drywall construction and we think that you know we are emulating west uh and uh, we are making lightweight buildings and that's what so just imagine we have in our uh in my short stint of 25 years i have actually built a building where we picked up the toilets like pods they were called pods sure. through the crane after the building was constructed and we uh, uh, you know uh, plugged it into the building so there were two uh, 120 keys in uh, formula 1 in greater noida so 120 toilets were plugged into the building after it was constructed so you can use uh, technologies today and do unique constructions and do very lightweight why do we have to do material over material so dematerialization lean architecture is a very important aspect because then you're not putting uh, uh, you know not digging out deeper foundations you're not uh, getting so much of construction material on site and spoiling the ecology and then when you break these down the construction waste has to be disposed of and this construction waste is of no no good because cement and uh, steel can be reused but cement and uh, probably bricks after they are taken out of a building they cannot be used 
right. to a large extent. So we have to look at the overall uh, package and you know uh, make it lighter. I think that's that's a very very important aspect of sustainable architecture. Right. So I have I will I will keep taking audience questions in between because uh, they love to have their questions answered and they always get impatient. So this is a question from Aditi uh, Padhi. Uh, would malls and retail get uh, obsolete? And is it possible to retrofit them into something else uh, just to make them sustainable and profitable? So a uh, very interesting question, Aditi. And I, I, like I said, I was discussing that we all think we have become smarter uh, because we have introspected and we are now thinking in a smarter way than before. So, uh, uh, you know, this, this will definitely change. Uh, most of the retail formats will be now experience centers. You'll, in any case, this, we were moving towards that because of e-commerce. So uh, you would go and probably experience a product, but buy online. So uh, the interaction uh, will be limited, will be only for those people. You will always also see e-commerce platform using 360 degree cameras, virtual technologies to explain the product in totality. Right now you only see pictures huh, when you go and buy clothes or any product and with different angles then you will have a, a almost to a real kind of experience through software very soon i think it will come in there are people i know a couple of friends who are working in this field um, so market will change to that so retail formats will completely change and most of the buildings today which exist and will not be broken will become multi use so you will see uh, retail mixed with offices uh, also mixed with some bit of hospitality Hospitality, a lot of hotels are not functioning and will not function anymore. So 30, 40 percent of the space will get unlocked, probably will convert into co-working spaces because the new phenomena will happen that people will not travel to. So if I'm staying in Noida and my company has head office in Gurgaon and I was traveling to Gurgaon every day. Now I will have my office will own some co-working space in Noida itself. So people will work from home on the day when they want to work and when they want to go to work and join or have a meeting together, they will go to a co-working space. Why to take the liability of setting up another office? So these, you'll have these commercial centers uh, getting decentralized and the retail will also unlock space into other formats. So every building will become multi-use because of that. Right. Uh, becoming micro universes in their own way, you know, so almost making yeah. it uh, like a city in itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, interesting. And I would go back to uh, our line of conversation, which was about uh, sustainable, necessarily not being uh, expensive. Uh, you may not have to worry about ROI and payback period. You know, uh, I, I wanted to ask a question more from uh, uh, the 50% of the people who construct the house on their own, you know. Uh, so normally in an FMCG product, you can buy a sachet. So what is the equivalent of a sachet for a sustainable architecture? Uh, what can I right. do to make my home sustainable? You know, because I, I cannot do this uh, fancy uh, engage with uh, an architect, uh, but you know, I want to do the right things. So how should I go about doing it? So, uh, um, you know, house is a place where you uh, come back and live your life and relax, right? So the building has to be a living creature like you. So if you create a living creature and allow building to breathe, to talk, to have that kind of experience, uh, which is close to you, will be something which will work for everyone. So that's the formula concept to start with. And then in terms of executing that concept, the first thing is that use materials which have a breathing, uh, you know, uh, capability. And then uh, transform that into something which is more sustainable, both environmentally and uh, you know, today, let's to give you an example, uh, what is the biggest uh, issue you have when you are staying in a house? Uh, the biggest issue is uh, maybe the water is not coming, electricity fails. So your systems uh, which run within the house, because we are so dependent on these systems today, uh, you get into trouble if they right. don't work. So if you can design a house and control everything through 
let's say iphone which is which is hardly any cost right and uh, uh, you can not only control your house from within the house you can control your house through internet while sitting in the office and when you do that a you will reduce your energy cost you will also control your house in a better way you will also know the health of your systems what is going wrong what is not so you will be able to make it uh, far more sustainable for you to live in that house b that the house has to be uh, conducive to your your personal requirements and uh, you know we start designing houses with how many bedrooms uh, living room drawing room so i always find it funny we design uh, and we use the technique of experience design so we you chart out an activity from morning till the evening let's say i am a morning person and i like to uh, read my newspaper and have my coffee early morning when my wife wants to sleep now how will a bedroom fan out for this sustainable home this bed will become a suite will have a partition which is sound proof and probably i like to sit out but delhi does not allow for the maximum time to to be sitting out sometimes pm 2.5 is high sometimes it's very hot sometimes it's you know uh, windy and dusty and you know things like that so so let's say we design a room where my wife sleeps and i sit in a sun room which is part of my bedroom with a nice uh, uh, glass roof and the sunlight comes through and it is air conditioned or air cooled and i read my newspapers and i sip my coffee like i would do on the terrace so sustainability is also about being user friendly sure so so if you chalk out your activities of how do you what are the activities do you do throughout the day and on a sunday it's different and on saturday it is different on a weekday it is different and you cater to it you will have far more sustainable otherwise what people do is that they keep changing because they don't know what they want when they start living in it because they have only thought of number of rooms and and this space and that space and they have not thought through the space does not uh, react well to them so they change so it's not sustainable for them sure yeah yeah so that's that's incredible i mean uh, i would call it uh, what's your journey in the house uh, uh, my my team knows me for doing purchase journeys of people so this sounds like a house journey which is an experience journey right i have a i have a interesting question from bandana jain uh you know you, you have a lot of students who are uh, having their own firms or part of other firms how how do you uh, encourage uh, other architecture firms to adopt sustainable architecture practices so uh, i cannot influence them the only way we can influence them is through our students so uh, out of five uh, usps for ivs uh, sustainability is one of them right it is there on the brochure uh, i uh, in the morning i was talking to the ceo and i was putting pressure on them uh, to tell you we are the first institute which works on a very different unique assessment formula for our studio uh, design uh, so in a design studio whatever you are designing there are five parameters which are a usp one is tech integrated design second is uh, inside out design third is uh, sustainable and environmental design so like that there are five categories sure. so everyone gets assessed on these parameters right secondly and i have told them to formalize it to also today in the morning i was telling them i said my uh, ceo was saying that people don't listen we keep telling them but even faculties miss out so i said base their variables on this if they don't adopt to this they don't get 50% of their variables because we are humans you know we like carrot and stick uh, we uh, policies and we only work on them unfortunately uh, so that is one the other thing is that we also adopted this unique formula and uh, we again trying to in institutionalize this formula where Uh, assessment happens on self assessment uh, teacher assessment peer assessment and uh, industry mentor assessment so nice. four formulas equally divided so self assessment is a very very important and a peer assessment is a very important two important aspects when you have to assess yourself you will cheat 10 times but the 11th time you will realize that you are not doing well 
and then you will give fair marks to yourself. When you assess someone uh, who's your peer, you will look at the criteria because you want to be good at that. And when you look at the criteria is when you will understand what is expected out of you. And uh, the scenario changes. So we are trying to put this in practice through these means. I hope I'm successful. And then if I'm successful that day, my students will change the world. Very nice. Incredible. I, I, I'm wondering of the kind of uh, conversations that happen between an architect and an MBA. And I know in a school you have both. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, I wonder who's the MBA or who wears the pants, so to say. <laughs> so I am not an MBA. Our CEO is. I know. Uh, That's exactly. and, and I have learned it the hard way from people like you. And uh, because I have not studied it, it's great that I still consider myself student for life because I think I'll never uh, learn enough. So I always feel small uh, in front of other people and that helps me uh, drive myself to learn more in this field, specifically in business. No, awesome. Inspiring. Uh, a question from Veer Chopra. Can there be any sustainability in architecture? if values and ethics are absent in the users. Okay, so that's, uh, that, uh, what was the name? Veer. Veer. Veer Chopra. Veer, uh, you are, you have hit the, uh, you know, uh, the real chord and uh, the problem lies with us. It doesn't lies with the, the leaders or the governments or, or other people. If we are truthful to ourselves and ethical in our practices, then we'll be able to change the world. Nobody will come and change the world for us. So uh, I hope that lockdown and the benefits which we got during lockdown will change the mindset to be at least truthful to your own self and to the next generation we are uh, breeding here. You know, humans are born in this world for their personal growth and evolution of their next generation. This is. This is the pure, simple, uh, uh, you know, agenda of mankind. So if we don't provide good uh, environment to our, uh, you know, future, our, our kids, we have not done the right job. And that's what we are doing. So we have to be ethical to ourselves and to our children. Forget anyone to come in and help us. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I just to add to it, you know, public good is always very difficult to evangelize. And yeah. uh, uh, it is tricky because uh, the temptation is to do uh, for an individual's hedonistic payoff. And it's tricky. It's, uh, it's, always, it's always a balance. And uh, uh, as Dharpan is saying, it's important to have your uh, values set right and evolve to the best version of yourself. Right. Uh, okay. A question from Prachi. Is it possible to develop sustainable, eco-friendly, smart technology uh, construction within the framework of social policy? Oh, yes. So, uh, I'll give you an uh, example to, to kind of uh, tell you that, that most of the buildings today, uh, which are essentially being used for anything, are the biggest uh, and you know, I've, I've studied many businesses, many organizations, 20 to 30% uh, cost of running any organization, any venture, social, economic, or any kind of uh, uh, venture requires 20 to 30% cost goes into running their premises, their habitat, their offices, their places, which they own. Right. And, uh, and a lot of it goes into 40 to 50% into manpower. And 20% are consumables. Consumables is, you know, water, uh, uh, you know, other sources, printer, paper, you know, so many other consumables with you. So just imagine if you make smart buildings only. Smart will allow you to have lesser manpower. Smart will also immediately allow you to be energy efficient. And uh, so energy, if you save, let's say 30 to 40% of energy, and 50% of manpower in running the facility, you can easily save up to 30% in running of this, uh, this building, 30 to 
So just imagine if you reduce 30 to 40 percent of the overall cost of running the building, which is 30 percent of the cost of your business, and right. manpower on top of that, you can easily reduce it to 40-50. It'll become sustainable for you. Most of the businesses are not going to do well now. If they don't look at this aspect, they will not be sustainable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, another question from Basav Raja. Uh, what is the uh, what is the reality and future of cavity wall constructions in India? Ah, so cavity walls have always been there uh, for a simple reason that uh, we have extreme climates in most of the parts of the country. So cavity walls work really well. The biggest problem I have seen in some of the cavity wall uh, solutions is sometimes hot air gets trapped. So a cavity wall has to have engineering where this hot uh, air can be uh, dissipated from, from these areas. Now, uh, the biggest, the other problem uh, which, is, which has come and why cavity walls have not become very uh, you know, uh, popular is that we have a subtropical climate and cavities and the areas, they propagate microbial growth. Right. And people don't want, and then we have rats and rodents and other issues in these mm -hmm. empty spaces. So uh, there are smart solutions to that. And hopefully with, uh, with new construction happening, and you know, there is a huge movement where people are now moving towards passive design because there was green buildings initially were getting made with most of the passive, uh, sorry, active uh, technologies. Mm -hmm. Now people are coming back to passive and hopefully with this kind of sustainable movement and you know us talking and various other people talking these passive ways will also become popular and someone will create a scenario where internal cavity walls will be again coated with bio guards and bio shield coatings not allow microbial growth to happen air to dissipate circulation to happen so these systems need to come up uh, and they have to be uh, modular and uh, you know uh, prefab in their approach only then it will become sustainable so, right. uh, so there will be this movement very soon. Right. And, you know, uh, the modular prefab thing is already happening uh, to a larger extent in Southeast Asia. What are the challenges of uh, that segment really picking up in India? I mean, are there uh, PMCs, uh, are there builders talking about it? Or is it just uh, still in, you know, webinars and uh, panel discussions, but not really seeing the light of the day? So, uh, so coming back, this is a very interesting question because I have myself been on various panels talking about it many a times. Yes. And, uh, but at the same time, from my uh, last 25 years in the career, I have built many prefab buildings. I have used many prefab technologies uh, where, like I told you, we had created pods, we had com made complete steel buildings. Rather, we are constructing our own building right now behind my office which is complete steel building, 100% steel, nut bolted. So it'll come from the factory, get assembled outside, uh, which is our own building. So, so I have done that and I professed. We've had great boardroom meetings uh, and I have given them ROI and I've shown them how they will make money on the project. Not, not save money, they will make money because being on a location before your, uh, your, your competitor comes is a great advantage. Absolutely. Having a low debt cost because of reducing your moratorium or construction time is a huge saving. Yeah. Uh, reducing 40%, 30 to 40% of foundation cost by building lightweight right. is amazing saving in the cost of construction itself. And I have given them figures and I have converted them. But India me kya bheed chala. It is very difficult to put in innovation. Uh, we are very good at uh, frugal innovation, but it is frugal innovation is limited to Jugaad. Right. It is, and it is high time that we take the world stage and we enter into frugal innovation because we are great at achieving these new ideas at lesser cost. Right. Because we have always, as a, as a, as a society, have had limited resources. Yeah. So we know how to do it in less resources. Sure. So, uh, so modular is going, is going forward. And let me tell you, post COVID, you will not have these workforce coming back. Government will make their arrangements in the villages. If you don't go modular, if you don't go prefab, you will not be able to do your projects. 
So that scenario has changed now. They'll be pushed. They'll be right. pushed. Right, right. No, uh, it should. I really hope the conversation catches uh, a much larger traction than it currently does. You know, so you yeah. were talking of Bhirchal and uh, it, it reminded me of uh, the kind of uh, advertising I often see of real estate, which is the tallest building, the most luxurious building, the building with the waterfall uh, or whatever else, you know. Uh, and it's all about how ostentatious, how luxurious it is and may not be in sync with uh, customer needs as well. So do you think with this uh, COVID crisis, uh, a lot of this unsold inventory would get re-examined, people would once again listen to architects or the customer, whichever be the voice that of sanity that prevails, and uh, uh, do very different kind of uh, uh, projects? So, uh... I don't know about Indian developers really need to reinvent themselves. And uh, I don't know whether this will change. This will definitely make them realize that these uh, mammoth buildings, real estate they've created, which are again non-sustainable uh, in any case, will die its death. So uh, reusing these real estate and reorienting will happen. I don't know whether, I'm not too sure whether they will listen to their architect. Because what has happened is, and I'll tell you, this is a, a, a very uh, interesting point. I have been, I started my practice 25 years back when scenario was that when the architect used to come into the room, the client used to stand. And uh, I still remember that when I got my uh, one, uh, uh, you know, contract from a multinational, which said vendor. So they had a contract which was basically a generic one which was given out to every single person. So when we were put, and today it is all vendors, so when architects were put in the vendor uh, situation where you were saying you're sitting on the other side of the table is when the problem started happening. Architects are still sitting on the other side of the table. And architects and clients to have successful design uh, ideologies, they have to get architect on board. He has to be a partner sitting on your side. Now that scenario is a very evolved thought process for the capitalist India, specifically for people who are neo rich and they've got uh, new money where they think that, you know, they, they own the world. We need to be humble. Uh, and hopefully that humility will change uh, because an architect is the one who's envisioning your thought process, your business formula into an habitat. So you have to get him on board. You have to make him sit on your side. For that, every single interaction with the architect has to change, including the contracts also. They have to be more collaborative contracts where there is scope of work written for the client also and architect and delivery incentives, not negotiating on their cost, but telling them if you save my this much cost, you will get so much incentive on top of, on top of your fees. And I can tell you architects are very smart. The community is very smart. They will always rise up to the cage. It's just that they have become dormant because they have been asked to do so. Right. That's, that's incredible. It is, uh, uh, it's a concept called value share happening in the management consulting world where uh, pretty much the top-notch consultants uh, apportion value of whatever value they generate. That is why I talking. love MBA guys. They have jargon for everything. And I tell a story in 20 sentences and people like you can shorten it with one jargon in one sentence. I, I love you guys for that. That is where I keep learning from you guys. It is a two-way street, Darpan. I mean, we keep learning design thinking from you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have a question from Bhanu. What is the future of uh, PEB, which sounds like pre-engineered, something building in, in in small and large projects like commercial and residential and what is the uh, sustainability of pb structure yes uh, he does clarify pb's pre-engineered building because you know building. the lingo yeah I, I think i need to do a cartoon on architect lingo there's enough and more cartoon on mba lingo and we will end up doing a cartoon on uh, architect lingo as well okay great I'm sure with your interactions with many architects, you will become half an architect yourself and you'll know the lingo. And then you can poke fun at us. 
because we are very funny humility we have our own eccentricities yes all of us do all of us do yeah so coming back to your question uh, p be like i was saying that p unit buildings is liber available and that will start immediately there are companies who are doing this they will immediately expand and you will see them becoming market leaders the new uh, companies will also emerge because they will see this opportunity and pb solutions in india has it's a lot i mean it's we should have actually taken up uh, these uh, buildings long time back even though in all the industrial uh, buildings this is uh, used uh, day in day out so there is no rocket science to it it's just that it has to be scaled up the only other thing is that in pb uh, in india people don't know how to make high rise buildings or multi uh that technology is also available but known to very few and most of these industrial shed buildings are doing pretty much one or two story construction so uh, you will see metal decking uh, con- uh, system you will see uh, hybrid buildings where you have half concrete half pb uh, coming in you will see modular uh, complete modular uh, pb structures where you know you'll have a you know one floor coming in the truck and will be just planted one on top of the other to kind of make a building so all of that is is there are there, there are companies who are doing that kind of engineering in india they just have to scale up now and this is the this is the future so you will see a lot of that happen right uh, you know your school itself is uh... digitally like uh, way ahead of its time or at least when you started out everything and i don't know what's happening with the current schools but the way you are using uh, vr the way you are using ipads and the way you are controlling the basics uh, is amazing and uh, do you see some of these technologies uh, or do you see some of the younger generation after having interacted so much with technology also bringing technology in architecture or uh, uh, technology uh when they are trying to develop sustainable cities and so on i actually lost you alok i didn't understand your question completely because you were cracking up in the middle can you just repeat that question please? sure no worries i will repeat it for you i was saying that uh, you know let's look at the graduates of ibs i mean they have come from a school that's steeped in technology uh, be it vr or the way they are controlling the lights and so on right So, uh, so do you see them uh, bringing about a larger change in the way architect firms take decisions, uh, or the way that uh, uh, they are designing buildings or cities? And you know, they, are they using technology much more? So, uh, so uh, you know, I will I will tell you about my journey. We have done five uh, smart buildings where you can operate a BMS system through your iPhone also, right? and uh, today it is far more easier to use technology because everything can be integrated back to a tablet or a or a phone so uh, it is need of the hour uh, uh, buildings are energy consumers and uh, a lot of money is spent on running these facilities so it makes sense to invest in this technology and it is not very expensive today we are doing a project with bhutani group and planting a uh, complete technology to control every single aspect to make it low touch to no touch so you don't touch any surface and you just move your hand and the door opens to controlling your light automation to uh, you know your air conditioning and temperature control into each area of the office co working space which we are doing it is costing for a project which is 15 crores worth is somewhere around 40 to 50 lakhs wow. right yeah now that is the kind of percentage it has come down to and this is comprehensive solution you can do it in parts and make it cheaper right so uh, so uh, that is what we are professing to our students also and you know it takes uh, for you to change and this is what i have realized when i when we started ivs uh, we are just 12 to 13 years old now and i thought that i will change the world in uh, two two years or so but i have realized it's a slow process uh, you have to uh, you know it takes us three years to churn out one batch and you need uh, five to six batches of students so 14 to 15 years of sustainable same thought process to be ingrained into professionals and then they go out to change the world 
so we started this uh, mantra 4 5 years back i think in another 4 5 years we will be in a situation to ch- because you know initially we were churning out we churned out 3000 professionals till date okay and now we are churning out 1500 every year okay so that's the difference so hopefully uh, our students with that mindset will change the world and i am sure other people also so just to tell you i the other division which we started was uh, post covid compliance so one of the major aspect of our new vertical is technology we have done this before we couldn't uh, you know our ceo had to shift out of india so there was no uh, so headless chicken will not do anything so we couldn't take this forward now we have again started this where uh, you know everything compatible to your iphone so a building manager or facility manager can see the health of the system and have a fully smart building operated out of a iphone or a tablet so this is the future and it doesn't cost too much why would you not do it you save again i like i told you 30 to 40% of your cost running cost it makes right. absolute sense you don't even need 3 years for a payback period you need 6 months very nice i i can see uh, some of the viewers saying ki, okay let's evaluate it at least because at 40 lakhs on 15 crores it's a very attractive proposition yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you you know you uh, tell me i mean this is a, a question close to me and uh, uh, i often see the architects uh, very indulgent in the tactile aspect you know they like to touch things feel things and uh, that's why you have experience centers for building materials now yeah. given the covid scare uh, would you be comfortable doing it in a digital way so i i actually did that and i was very skeptical about it i think it was pretty okay not so effective uh, not 100% effective but i did the job and we cho- we chose the samples and the chosen ones were called to the office so uh, the guy took us around in a very simple way you can do it with the software in a more efficient way he we were on a whatsapp call he was facing me he switched on the camera and he was taking me around in his showroom in his experience center and took me around right let me also tell you how it can be done now we i like i told you we were talking before and i was telling you that ivs has uh, just uh, taken out a art fest we are running a art fest which is an international art festival and for the first time in india we are uh, shooting it on three dimensional camera so what we will do is we will we will have that art gallery shot in 3d 360 degree camera then we will plonk the artwork in virtual uh, this thing in the actual short space in a virtual format in actual short space right. and then we will have that experience given to people on the uh, internet and online so you guys can easily do it and right. it will at least take us to a level of shortlisting and then sending out these samples to someone's office and then do that your tactile thing, uh, bit which which will be the final i think uh, process to to shortlist a material so that is one the other thing is i can tell you uh, and we are uh, we are now selling couple of technologies through which you can completely sterilize interiors without really doing anything it there are technologies which get mixed into the air and you can completely sterilize your interiors so experience centers can be completely sterilized zones and people can go and touch and and not get covid even that is possible right interesting so that's another product that's very likely to have a incredible future in the days to come right yes uh, incidentally you must explore our website and you would be able to go through filters and all kinds of things to narrow down your selection as you were saying yeah so let me tell you madhur who's a very dear friend of mine he had launched this app and i still remember in greece when we had all gone for this conference and he joined in and i was very very excited about it and that was uh, you know at that time and this is long time back a great uh, endeavor by madhur to to be and he is a great guy I and mean, he's very futuristic always looks ahead so so i i'm sure it must have progressed even further some of the uh, people in my office keep using it and keep raving about it Oh, nice. Glad to hear. I will definitely pass that message on to him. Right. Sure. Uh, cool. So, uh, 
So do you see sustainable catching on a lot more after COVID? Yes, I think, I hope so. And I am, I, uh, you know, I have taken the, I've become the flag bearer uh, because I think people forget very soon. Uh, and I've, I've, I've been talking to people and they're very, very receptive, at least right now. I hope to, uh, you carry this, uh, you know, in future and be the, be the leader or, or, or the flag bearer for this. Right. And uh, can it help the recovery? Can it help the bounce back? Absolutely. Uh, sustainable is something which will be low cost in terms of its operation also. Right. And uh, we will not have excessive money in the next two to three years. And we better get ready to, to have everything based on sustainability. And uh, sustainability in business is very, very important. And buildings are very important part of our running businesses because that's the habitat from where we do our businesses. And whether it is even manufacturing company like you, where you'll have your factories, you have to be very, very sustainable in terms of additional costs. So you may spend on your machinery, get the best machinery, but why spend on other things, uh, power, consumption, cleanliness, and other parameters. So if you can reduce all of that, you will yourself become a sustainable business in, in bad times. So everyone will, uh, will hopefully understand this. Uh, uh, the important thing is, as architects, we have to be very clear in defining what parameters, on what parameters you're choosing sustainability. Because the minute you say sustainability, client thinks economic sustainability is not part of it. It's social probably and environmental. Whereas economic stability and sustainability is very, very important aspect of this. The minute you sell it with that, your client will buy that idea and highlight that out of all the other three. That's right. the smart thing architects can do. Great. Great. The problem, other problem I want to tell is architects need to learn maths. And we need to learn a lot from MBA guys. If we, if we understand the business aspect and we talk in that language with our clients, they'll be far more, ex, uh, they will accept your ideas in a much better way because they are doing business. And everything is oriented towards that. And we are smart people. Uh, we always say architects are smarter than clients. So why can't we handle our clients better? Why can't we hypnotize them? Why can't we uh, make them do things which we want them to? You are already making me do things you want me to. So <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting thing. You know, I had a very similar thread of conversation with uh, Gino Kurian last week when he was talking about uh, how he was uh, initially afraid of numbers and financials. Uh, right. and, uh, uh, I was telling him that I'm talking with you this week and uh, uh, I'm suddenly recollecting. So in your school, do you, do you teach uh, financial management, entrepreneurship as well to your students? So yes, uh, we, we help them do uh, many exercises which are oriented towards that. Rather, we had tied up with uh, a couple of organizations because CDI does uh, a lot of work on startups and entrepreneurship. So that allowed us to kind of have this kind of partnerships across the globe, not only in India. So uh, IVS is getting total benefit, uh, you know, benefits out of uh, these practices. And we have, we've done, we've done hackathons. We've done uh, students to come in, do startup challenges, come up with ideas, entrepreneurial ideas and present it and how to make a company out of it, credible business out of it. So those kind of, uh, um, you know, processes are completely on. And I hope that uh, with the growth of CDI, we'll have, uh, you know, uh, great benefits going to IBS. Because in design, we need to understand uh, not only the entrepreneurial skills, but also the business aspect. Because uh, in, in commercial arena, it's purely economic. So if it doesn't make sense for your client, your idea will not work. And we have to, it, it is high time architects come out of their whims and fancies. And, uh, you know, you can do a great job. You can provide amazing solutions in uh, limited cost, effective cost. And uh, again, live your whims and fancies in a different way, but still live your fancies. And don't get emotionally attached to your, to your work. It, it has to be practical. It has to be for the client, for the site. It doesn't have to be you. So most of the architects behave like artists. We cannot. We have, we have great responsibility. Right. 
I keep thinking you're becoming more and more an MBA. And uh, <laughs> I, I have actually, I'm learning. Like I said, I'm a student of, of business. So I, and I will always be because I'll always think that I have not done enough. I lack that. I didn't, I couldn't do my MBA during my young days. Uh, sure, sure. I think uh, that's, uh, that makes you successful having not done an MBA. So uh, if I were to look at uh, a lot of successful people, they have dropped out of MBAs. So you, you didn't miss much. Uh, I think I have one last question from Nikhil Kumar and uh, I will try and be accurate about it, which is uh, what technologies uh, dominate in the field of uh, smart ecolo ecology uh, or for sustainable cities? Uh, I'm not sure I've got the question right. It's, uh, Even I haven't, I have not understood what is the intent of the question. If we can probably specify uh, what exactly uh, is he asking about? Because so, smart cities is a whole lot of subject, and I, if I start talking about it, I'll probably take two more hours. And I, I am, I am pretty long in my conversations. Not very crisp. Sorry. So, so Nikhil, he has an offer, uh, and I, I'm going to charm the point to agree to it. Is mail us the question again, and I will ask. Uh, uh, and I will get that one's response uh, mailed to you because, uh, uh, you know, it's already been about 75, 80 minutes and it's not fair to keep that one uh, engaged with us like this. Uh, I think you've been incredibly nice that one. It's been fascinating. Uh, Thank you so much for asking uh, such lovely questions. No, and I think listening to you, it's great to exchange views uh, of you, what you think uh, very passionately about and, you know, you want to share it to the whole world. I think you've given an amazing platform for me too. Because I, I actually was talking about sustainable architecture. I took a couple of webinars during lockdown time uh, with our students and professionals from the field. But this is, uh, you know, it was one way. I think, uh, uh, you know, this kind of interaction with you being there and then people asking questions is far more fruitful and far more interesting for people to watch. No, glad to hear that. You know, what we typically do is uh, we create excerpts of this uh, conversation uh, put it on a blog because we got about uh, a couple of lakhs vis uh, visiting our website. It is uh, it is the the top website in the category, so it it stays it stays alive forever. Uh, we will link it up with your social media handles. Uh, uh, I realize you are not very active in social media, but you know I would connect it at least with IVS and CDI and uh, perhaps the more active part of your founder group. And uh, so I I'm a hypocrite. I sell technology, but I don't adhere to it. I have always refrained myself. I've never been on Facebook. Can you imagine? Uh, yes. Yes. It's, uh, it's unusual. <laughs> yeah. So I, I see a couple of failed attempts to get onto Facebook. So, uh, which obviously I, I would love to get onto LinkedIn now because I think LinkedIn is a great platform that way. It's so very penetrative you, and you have right kind of people coming. Right. So connect with me offline and I can tell you how to uh, build your profile on LinkedIn. Uh, okay. So uh, I'll take that, some tips. Yes. With that note, let's end. Thank you guys for joining us again. Uh, we, have, thank you. Uh, thank you. we have another architect from the education sector uh, next week. So do join us next week again. I think we are meeting on Saturday if I'm right. We'll keep you posted. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you. That Thank point. you. Thank you so much. It was great fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello, can we ending the session? Thank you.